You might have someone presenting on it, so I just want to leave this information. It's also useful information for the midterm uh, once we get closer to that. Um, okay, well, the first thing I want to talk about today, I was thinking about what I said last time, and in the last class, I, you know, I talked about how little God appeared to be a factor in Caruso's early life, but what I also could have said to you, which probably would have been more helpful, was, you know, isn't it interesting that we have absolutely no references here to Greek gods or Roman gods? And this is the first writer uh, we've encountered this semester who hasn't been taken up with classical ideas, okay? Uh, even Christopher Columbus uh, was talking about Greek uh, astronomers and photographers and, and people like that. So this is really the first time we have someone who has absolutely no apparent interest in these subjects. Uh, and that may seem pretty normal to us, but I think in the context of our class, which is how I want you to be thinking about things, um, uh, it's very important to be you know, noticing that. Well, why is that the case? Well, one of the things I want you to keep in mind is, is that the audience for these stories is changing, okay? When, when Chaucer was writing, or when Milton was writing, uh, when, or uh, even when, uh, even when Car uh, Columbus was writing, excuse me, they were, they were writing uh, to very different kinds of audiences. Um, when the wife of Bath starts to speak, or when the knight starts to speak in the Canterbury Tales, um, the information that comes out of their out of their faces is information that would have been understood uh, by a moderately to highly educated uh, group of people. They would get the religious references, they would get the classical references, they would get the jokes, they would get the puns because of the, the rhyme scheme for the poems. Um, and so we see a lot of that, but when Caruso opens his mouth, what comes pouring out is very different. Uh, he has virtually nothing to say uh, for long periods of time about any of these issues. Uh, and what he primarily talks about are things that would be readily understood by people who were trade-oriented, okay? People who had made, a, built a vineyard or built a wall or put together a fortress or who knew how to sail or who had, uh, who had uh, uh, you know, traded with other nations, uh, people uh, who, who would have these specific kind of trade-oriented orient, uh, or, uh, experiences. Um, so the audience is changing, and that's a really important thing to notice, because as the audience for this literature changes, the kinds of stories we're going to read and encounter is going to change uh, pretty quickly. What I really want to talk about today are, are the two most important things, I think, that came up in the reading for us. Uh, we had two things, big things happen in these 50 pages. First is the religious awakening of Caruso. Okay, he has this religious experience, and he has a dream in which he sees what? What does he see in the dream? This, 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 this is kind of, it's God, but it's also kind of this monster, isn't it? It's kind of this man on fire who comes down and raises a, a spear, I believe it is, and tells him that he's about to die, and then he wakes up, and he and he's had this religious conversion. And the second thing he talks about, which may have bored some of you, was anybody bored by all the physical labor descriptions? Like, I'm going to make a basket now. I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a hut now. And then, and then he would go on and describe it. And you may have found that boring, but there's a reason for it. Well, let's talk about the religious stuff first. Um, we might think about how different uh, this version of God is than any kind of God we've encountered before this semester. Uh, when he's talking about God and, and he's thinking about God, this is the first character who understands God through the context of his own experience. And you, you, you probably want to write that down. He understands God through the context of his own experience, which is a very modern idea that most of us are probably familiar with. Um, uh, and very different from, people, uh, from ideas that would have been held by people like Dante and even Chaucer. Okay, to see God only through the context of your own experience. Uh, and what I mean by that is he, he only thinks about God, or he only wonders about God, as somebody who acts directly in his life. He thinks about God as someone who acts directly in his life, as if God had a direct hand and interest in his existence. God's going to give me this corn. God gave me the, uh, the, uh, the tools on the boat. God saw fit to give me these clothes. These are not statements that we would find in Chaucer. These are not statements that we would find in Milton necessarily. This is a very different way to think about God. 
Okay, and the example uh, I want to give you uh, from our own culture uh, is, it, or, or how it's a part of our own culture. Think about uh, basketball players, baseball players, or American Idol winners who thank God or Jesus after they win a game. Okay, um, and, and and they thank Him directly because they, their understanding is that God has acted in their own life to help them win. Okay, that's a very different understanding of God than what than the one we've been dealing with. Uh, for the past three or four weeks, the idea that God is is actually in my in our life, and and I actually uh, Jason last time had the image of Buddy Jesus uh, at the end of his presentation, but but in, and that's a joke, but but it's but it's 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 closer to reality than you may think. The idea that I have this personal, deep personal connection with God, okay, rather than Him being or you know God being this giant thing up in heaven that rules over all existence, the idea that He has an interest in my own life. Is, is a very different religious understanding than what we've encountered before. Okay. Um, and I have up on the board here, uh, it's not found in anything that we've read before. Think about Dante. Uh, and um, Gavin brought up the, uh, the idea of Beatrice. It's Beatrice who guides Dante and Virgil who guides Dante. It's not God who guides Dante. Um, when, Colum when Columbus goes and sees the savages, he calls them. Uh, uh, these are people who've been overlooked by God, people who God has apparently no interest in until they sent him, you know, Mr. Wonderful Christopher Columbus, from Columbus's own point of view, okay? Uh, and I'm not siding with Columbus here. Uh, but we have these, we, and then when you look at, uh, at Chaucer, if you think about the Knight's Tale, Arsite and Palamon, they, never, they, they, they need to pray to the gods to get what they want. They pray to the god of love, and they pray to the god of war, and then they get what they want. Uh, gods, these gods aren't acting directly in their life without without uh, their being asked. But if you're going to go with Christopher, with uh, Robinson Crusoe, excuse me, you have to believe that God's acting in his life even when he's not ask, when he's not asking for it. Otherwise, God wouldn't have put him on the island. God wouldn't have put him in a certain situation. He did. So even when you're not asking for God's input, you're getting it in Robinson Crusoe's universe. Okay, so that's a very different way of thinking about God um, for our class in our context. Uh, but I also want you to think about, and you all take notes on this as well, uh, the second weirdest thing about today. And that is what you guys are starting to talk about. How does he know how to do this? How, how does he know to keep track of the weather? Um, Caruso, left to his own devices, appears to have no idea of how to spend his time. Uh, other than by spending it to construct the same basic goods that were fueling the British Empire at that time. He's building tables. He's building baskets. He's making walls, he's putting together clothes. He's, there's a point that where, where it gets a little absurd, I think you might notice. He seems to make all the stuff he basically needs to survive, and then he keeps creating all these material goods. And he keeps creating, he keeps creating. And you might say, well, yeah, he's bored. Well, okay, I think that's part of an answer. But why can't he stop? He appears to have this incredibly rigid schedule that he follows, and he just keeps producing all of these goods. Okay, and he has basically this wealth of, uh, of material around him uh, by the point that we reach today. And I think the idea of a, of a vineyard that Matt, that Matt brought up, the idea that you associate some of these goods with incredibly wealthy people, or you might be tempted to, but here's this guy on this island with nothing but time, and what does he do? Well, he just creates all of this, all of this material for himself, okay? And again, I don't think you would have found anyone uh, in Chaucer's, if you stick a wipe of bath, on an island, she's not going to make tables all day. Uh, if you stick, uh, if you stick the friar or the doctor or any of these people, they're not going to be overcome with the desire to create goods. Okay, uh, they might have other things they might be wondering about and working for. Some of them might just simply die from despair. I don't know. 